Okay. Alejandro, welcome. Well, thank you, Jim, for inviting me. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. All right. So as, as an intro to everyone, um, let's walk through one of your first forays into building companies and maybe one or two of the lessons learned from all that wealth of experience. Well, um, I guess one interesting experience was uh, it, it wasn't the first company that I founded, but it was uh, a while ago. It was uh, the late 90s. And uh, it was a company that went through an enormous uh, fast growth. So we, we started uh, in late 97 and by late 99, we already had a run rate of about $30 million. Uh, so that's, that's quite a, a fast growth. Um, and at that point in time, everything looked rosy. And, and so just to kind of fast forward here, the, the lesson that I got from that experience was timing is really crucial. And, uh, and it's very hard to plan for timing uh, and to plan for the right moment. So sometimes you just have to be patient because what happened at, at the end of 99 was Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, they came to us and you know, I was a co-founder at the time I had a minority stake in the business. They said, you guys are worth $1.7 billion. Let's take you public, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I was uh, enthused about that. And, yeah. uh, and then they asked us to do a series of things, uh, consolidate this, consolidate that and ramp up spending here and there. Anyway, long story short, um, by June of 2020, we were just ready to, to launch our, our S1 statement and, and the IPO was canceled. The market conditions had changed, et cetera, et cetera. And around that time, it became apparent to me that my parent company was running out of money, hmm. which was very bad news because at the time we had a very high cash burn. Um, and so I started looking around and I organized an MBO offer um, together with some industrial firms that was not accepted. Then they changed their mind two months later. About that time, my, my financial backers had walked away. So I organized another offer and so on and so forth. So two or three offers and, and every time the offer was you know a lower value. So finally, in March 2020, no, 2001, sorry, we, we put in the final offer at 80 million. So it had gone from 1.7 billion to 80 million. That depressed my majority uh, shareholder and partner so much that they just decided to go into liquidation and just, they gave the keys to the creditors and that was it. And so then I decided, you know, um, we've hit rock bottom. So from here on, it's all upside. And so, uh, we put together a plan and I, I purchased actually from the liquidators this, this company uh, for one euro. And we were proceeded to, you know, so we'd gone from $1.7 billion to one euro in the space of 12 months. So uh, we then, you know, restructured the company and that was like three or four years of, you know, lots of adventures. And finally sold the company together with a subsidiary company that went through a similar process for a little bit above $30 million. Um, so I guess my point is the same set of assets went through a fluctuating series of valuations over a relatively short period of time. And the key to survival, if you will, was, you know, writing out the, the bad moments and, and waiting for, you know, the good moments. So timing was uh, really important. So you mean to tell me just because you have a one point something billion dollar valuation doesn't mean it gets bought the next day for that exact amount? <laughs> uh, I didn't know that at the time, but you're right. It's not <laughs> it's not <laughs> automatic. <laughs> I thought it well, was. Well, no, but it is. It, it, so many people do. Right. Um, you know, it's it's um, you know, you try to push up for this this high valuation and you you think that's the right thing to do because it signals to the market that you're you know, making ground and you're driving growth and, and all these things. And, and at the end of the day, that doesn't mean that somebody's willing to buy it for that. So that's a great, that's a great story in valuation fluctuation, but also I imagine some incredible lessons learned 
for from from you. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I and I know that you've done you know you've done MBOs, turnarounds. You've done you know almost IPO you, IPOs, right? You've you've gone public transactions, private transactions, and now you've got this awesome company that you've been growing for the last fourteen years. That is. Um, well, I'm not going to ruin the surprise. I'll let you talk more about it. But is is really kind of changing the game in user experience, right? So, when you know, I, I go to your website, userlytics.com, and I see user experience eats strategy for breakfast. Talk to me about what that means. Sure, that that was kind of a pun on Peter Drucker's famous saying that you know, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And and we're actually yeah. a firm believer in what Peter said there. Um, I, I think that for a growing company, having a culture uh, that empowers individuals and, and brings out the best in them, uh, that's, that's more important than almost anything. Uh, but having said that, I did say almost anything because uh, <laughs> user experience, I think, trumps everything. Um, I, I think a great example is Zoom. If you think about Zoom, you know, they came to the market 13, 14 years late. You know, there was a bunch of entrants before that. Go to mm-hmm. meeting, WebEx, Skype, you name it. Their pricing model, their product was not really fundamentally different, except for one thing. It was a slightly better user experience. And they own the market. Now it's, you know, they are the market essentially. And uh and there's there's many examples of that. So user experience is is really a critical uh, component of success for any company. So I would urge small companies. I would urge large companies. I would say if you're spending, you know, one dollar on marketing, one dollar on sales, and ten cents or one cent on user experience, think about changing those ratios just a little bit. It doesn't have to be much. User experience will really uh, vastly uh, assist you in market share, competitiveness, pricing power, valuation, you name it. I didn't really answer your question as to what we specifically did, uh, but you know, we, we, we try to help companies optimize their user experience by making it easy for them to test the user experience of their prototypes, their websites, their mobile apps, etc. So when you when you look at your own business, right, um, and your own prioritization of of user experience, um, you know, would you say that you prioritize user experience over all other areas, and that's what's led to your success, or how do you really mix in, you know, the investment? Given that you've been really bootstrapped from the ground up, how do you how do you how do you balance your investment into user experience versus sales and marketing versus you know anywhere else that you could put your dollars? It's a great question because the the temptation always is go for the new feature, right? You know, your your business developer guys are saying, you know, these other guys have this feature, or our clients have asked us for this feature, or or this and that, or or maybe you're thinking, well, maybe we should spend more money on this particular sales and marketing initiative, or maybe we should invest in this new interesting research uh, R&D initiative. But um, what we try to do in Userlytics is have a really strong uh, focus on improving the user experience. So when we do the budget every year, of how much of our development resources are going to be allocated, uh, I'd say 60, 70 percent is towards the user experience. And it takes time for that to show up in the results. So it's it's not one day to the next. Uh, right. It's always easier to say, well, if I just roll out this new feature, that'll take me uh, to Nirvana. But uh, I think it's it's worth considering maybe if I take my existing features and just make them really really easy to use, maybe that's a better investment of my time and money. So when you, when you see other businesses that um, you know, I don't want to say you're lecturing, but that you that you that you educate on on spending into user experience, do you typically see it that they're 
you know, prioritizing what you just mentioned features, features and fun, you know, over, over the actual experience or, or do you see that they're, you know, investing everything they have into customer acquisition and maybe customer retention, but just ignoring R and D altogether or somewhere in between or kind of a mix? Yeah. What do you, what do you typically see? Yeah, I- Exactly that. I was talking to a company today. They they uh, they have 357 employees. They've got one employee that uh, is in charge of user experience research, and that person is being asked to do everything, and uh, they don't have the resources. And uh, you know, and and when she goes to the company and says to the product manager, the CPO, whatever, and, and says, you know, hey. I think you should uh, change this because, you know, the clients really want this or the users really need this. And they're saying, yeah, 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 it's interesting. But we want to roll out this other feature. So we don't have uh, we don't have the time right now. We don't. But we'll, well, it's a great idea. We'll we'll park that and we'll we'll get to that someday. So, you know, so yeah. someday it becomes, you know, never. Um, I think a good analogy to think about this is. If you imagined a world in which all of a sudden the toothbrush, which had did not exist, was invented. So before the toothbrush was invented, how did people manage their teeth? Well, they waited until there was a big pain. Then they went to the dentist. The dentist pulled it out. And, and that's kind of the world we live in before companies started focusing on user experience. It's like you roll out features, you wait until somebody screams in in pain or in agony, and then you do something about it. Uh, Whereas, you know, just paying attention, you know, brushing your teeth every morning, it's not a big deal. But we do it because we've been trained since we were little kids. If we were asked, you know, at a later age to start doing it, it would be tougher to do. So, So it is difficult to get companies to change that mindset. But it pays off in huge dividends if they do. Do you, do you have any examples, uh, whether it's at Userlytics or another one of your your uh, your companies that you that you ran? Um, I'm sure it's probably at Userlytics though that you um, that you invested over invested. Some might call it um, in in user experience, and that you saw a very clear uh, ROI or a very clear significant return for Userlytics on the other end of it. So um, I have to say that before user Linux, I was not a convert to this whole thing of user experience. So user, you know, uh, this came to me with user Linux and, and I realized how important this was. Um, so I, I don't have, you know, examples of, of previous to user Linux. Um, I, I can tell you that our clients every day are making decisions that, that have huge impacts sometimes in just their conversion funnel improves uh, sometimes their retention. Oftentimes it's both um, their competitiveness. But I think if, if, if we look at different companies that have seemingly out of nowhere become hugely successful almost overnight, nine times out of 10, the answer is the user experience. It's not because of the price. It's not because of this. It's always the user. It was easy for me to figure it out. It was easy for me to use, or it was delightful. I mean, one thing is being easy. That's kind of like the the, the lowest metric you can you can meet. But how often do you use an app or a website, and you walk out of that and saying, "Wow, that was a delightful experience." That, that's really what should be the goal. Now, at the bare minimum, it should be easy, easy to use. Yeah. Unlike, unlike when I order uh, Chinese food off of the random website that they stood up back in 2010 that looks like it was stood up in 1990. That's not great well, user experience. <laughs> I, I can tell you one thing that even though, of course, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement, but... The U.S. is largely far ahead of many countries, uh, I would say most countries, in terms of user experience adoption. And, and you see that when you travel overseas and you start using these websites from these huge companies that have the resources yeah. to spend and do something. 
and their user experience, you're saying, oh my God. And, it, and, it's, and it's then when you really notice the difference. Now, we still have a ways to go, obviously in the US also, but, uh, but if, when you travel to some of these other countries, you see, wow, <laughs> we have done quite a bit over in the US and the UK also. Uh, UK, US, Canada, Australia, uh, they, they've been kind of at the forefront of this revolution, so to speak. So what is, what is the best way for, for business owners and, and business leaders to, to shift their mindset and get it right? Like what's the, what's the best first step? Let's say it's you 20 years ago before Userlytics, right? What, like what would have been the best step for you or for others to just, you know, really shift their mindset and get this right? About user experience. The single most important thing would be for the owner, CEO, top executives to observe their clients or their prospects or their users using their assets or trying to use their assets or, or trying to do whatever it is they as a company think they should be able to do. If they do nothing else, if they just do that, I don't need... I or nobody else needs to tell them anything else. They'll, they'll understand immediately, wow, how important this is. But they can't just say, mm -hmm. I've got a fantastic designer. I've got a fantastic uh, product manager. I've got a fantastic development team. I'm sure that's true. But until those people actually watch people using it, right. that's when everything changes. Mark Twain used to say, you know, there's uh, – there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics, right? And uh, if you get into a room where the developer, the designer, the marketers, they're all sitting around and they're arguing about statistics about we should change this because of this survey result. We should change this because of this or that. If you show to them a video of somebody interacting with the prototype or the website or the mobile app, all the arguments go away. It's like, you can't argue with that. It's there. It's, right. it's, it's clear, you know? And, that, and that's what yeah. we try to provide our, our clients with that uh, powerful uh, video evidence. All right, I wanna talk about something that's hot in the world in general right now, just not, not just in user experience, not just in, in business, but just in, in life in general. Um, artificial intelligence, right? AI. And uh, obviously the last six months since open AI kind of started to, you know, m mass reach people, it's been become just a, an insane, almost commodity, not commoditization, but, you know, uh, certainly like some sort of, uh, democratization, if you will, an ability to use it. And, and, um, I want to talk about how just general AI ties into what Usalytics is doing now and in the future, right? Like, uh, how is how is AI currently integrated into Userlytics services? Let's start there. Sure, we we um, we had been looking to use AI for years, but when OpenAI came on the scene uh, with ChatGPT, it was like all of a sudden it became much easier to to yeah. do that, and uh, so we jumped on the bandwagon and we. Uh, launched an integration with OpenAI in April of this year. And what that does is it basically uh, we use artificial intelligence on the one hand to transcribe the video sessions, what the participants said as they were interacting with a mobile app or a prototype or a website. Mm. And, uh, and then we use uh, essentially ChatGPT 4.0 to uh, synthesize and analyze uh, into um, not exactly a full-fledged report, but at least, you know, these are the key points. These are the key issues. These are the key themes that emerge. So, you know, our company and, and our peers, when we appeared on the scene uh, 14 years ago, we compressed the time required to launch a qualitative video-based user experience study from what used to be weeks, you know, setting up a laboratory, getting people organized to a matter of days or even hours. However, somebody has got to watch these videos. 
I mean, there, we create quantitative data and all that stuff that you can watch and, and, and digest easily. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the videos are really the heart of it because that's where all the, the, the rich insights are, are laying there to be discovered. But somebody has got to listen to them. So AI is, right. is, is allowing us to compress that time, too. And uh, yeah, we're working on version 2.0 and version 3.0, et cetera. So ultimately, we think that AI, what it will do is it will lower the price and the cost and the time required to run one of the studies that we do so that people who may not have the budget to use our consultants to produce reports and, and this and that, but they just want a basic AI produced synthesis. They can launch a study and get that synthesis within a matter of hours and uh, at, a, at a really low price point. So it'll compress the time and it'll compress the price and thus it'll expand the market. So we, we think it's quite exciting. And in that sense, I think it's Probably a good example of, of many different ways AI is going to be impacting society and business at large. It's going to, is it going to affect some jobs? Yes, but it's also going to bring down the price and, and compress the speed. So that's going to expand demand for services. And so right. ultimately, I, I think it'll be a net a job creator. Uh, that's my optimistic take, I guess. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, if- well... That- I, I got a couple follow on questions to that because I love the optimism. What 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 how do you see that impact? Like let's start with first specific to user experience in businesses. Like you can pick whatever two, five, ten years down the road, whatever, you know, whatever period of time you think is applicable. But you know, wh- how do you see uh user experience looking in a couple years and, and how does AI kind of affect that that future? That's a great question. And that that's a little I, I wish I knew the answer to that because uh, <laughs> you don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the battery ran down. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the heat melted it. But uh, um, yeah. yeah. So Bill Gates was saying the other day that he thinks uh, one of the things that AI will bring is these. Uh, these AI powered chat uh, personal assistants so that for example, he thinks it'll have a big impact on entities like Amazon because he thinks people will no longer go to Amazon. They'll just go to their personal assistants and say, Hey, I'm looking for some cool stereo speakers that I can put in my walls and that do this and that. And they'll, they'll look for options and present, look, this is the best and the cheapest. This is the one you should go with. And do you want me to buy it? Yes, go ahead. So, you know, if that future came to be true, then AI would have disintermediated Amazon, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazon is probably smart enough to say, you know what, I'm going to get ahead of the game and I'll, I'll provide the, the, the AI personal assistance <laughs> to avoid that, that fate. Right. But, uh, but anyway, um, that has important implications for us because – who knows? Maybe the user interface becomes less important in the future because AI is doing everything in the background. So AI, on the one hand, is going to be a tremendous assist to our business, but I also can see certain scenarios where it might be a threat to our business. Uh, but it's really hard. You know, like I say, the crystal ball is melted. And, and so I, I don't know. Uh, well, that's what you we'll, get we'll, for we'll, living in Miami and Spain, Alejandro. I mean, it's going <laughs> to melt. I got to move north to Vermont, but then I'm going to have to learn how to swim. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. And, and swim through ice nonetheless too. Um, all right, cool. So there's, there's one last topic that I really want. I have been so excited to talk about with you because I think that you've been, um, in incredible, incredibly thoughtful in the way that you've expanded your international footprint. Um, and taking off in in non English speaking markets, and and I'd just like you to walk us through um, your approach at Userlytics to expanding in in non English speaking markets because I think a lot folks could learn a ton from the way and the the challenges and the approach and, and everything that you've done in in that expansion. Thanks. I mean, 
we we do have now a very decent footprint uh, internationally. We've we've got enterprise customers in 35 countries. We've done projects in 79 countries. We've got 1.8 million participants all around the world. Um, when we first set out to internationalize, which was about I'm going to say five, maybe four years ago. Um, at the time, I thought of it as the more traditional approach, like, okay, we're going to have to go to Germany, hire a bunch of German-speaking uh, customer service, German-speaking business development, set up an office there, then we do France. And, you know, so the costs of that kind of expansion quickly multiply. What we found out was that that wasn't necessary. We could hire German-speaking customer service, German-speaking business development within the country that we were countries we were operating, U.S. and Spain, and they could service because you know it's the internet, it's a globally connected world. They could service our clients remotely, as it were, from whichever location they were, and of course we could translate our our websites and our dashboards and everything else into, and in fact, we have it now translated into, I don't know, something like 30 languages. Um, but then COVID came and this accelerated even further because now people started moving all over the world and, you know, all these countries started coming out with these nomad visas, trying to encourage people to come to Costa Rica, come to Mexico, come to Portugal, come to, you know, etc. And so there's this tremendous mobility of people around the world which means effectively that you can service clients all over the world using staff that may or may not be all over the world, but could easily be all over the world. I mean, we have staff in the Philippines, in Finland, in Portugal, Spain, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil. Um, so you don't need to establish a physical presence in all these places. You can just, you know, have your, headquarters and your one or two or three, you know, key locations and everything else can be done remotely. And that, and that's, that means that the cost of doing business overseas has radically come down and it becomes much easier, uh, to, to work, uh, with, with all these huge markets. And, uh, a lot of what U S companies provide, there's a latent demand for their services and products overseas that is not being satisfied only because U.S. businesses have not really, you know, been aggressive enough to go out there. I'm, I'm talking about small and medium-sized businesses. Obviously, large U.S. businesses have. Uh, so, so I see a lot of opportunity there for, for U.S. Uh, uh, fast-growing companies to expand uh, internationally. What are, what are some of the challenges that you guys hit in, when, you, when you first started doing that expansion? So, um, in it, details, really, things that you, you, you little by little learn. But um, um, so one, one thing is that, for example, in Scandinavia and in Germany, uh, participants are much more adverse to being recorded, to having their face recorded. And they're very worried about data privacy. And uh, so, you know, putting their minds at ease that, you know, we are not going to sell your data to the CIA and, you know, you're, we're going to follow the European regulations in terms of GDPR and uh, et cetera, et cetera. That, that was super important. Um, and um, so, you know, there are these cultural nuances when you go from uh, – territory to territory. But then it's, it's not only challenges. Sometimes you find opportunities because you, you find, for example, that certain countries in the world that you think of as, for example, the, the Gulf countries in um, you know, Saudi and uh, Dubai, etc. One tends to think of them as, okay, they're, they're Arabic speaking. So you know, that would be a huge challenge from a language perspective, not just the, the verbal language, but the written language is, you know, is completely different, script, etc. But English is kind of the language of business in those regions. So mm -hmm. it wasn't 
as difficult as it might have seemed. So, so sometimes, you know, there are opportunities that one would not suspect uh, in, as you expand internationally. When, when you think of um, somebody else or if you were giving advice to it, to another founder, maybe one listening in even that's, that's doing this international expansion for the first time, um, what's, you know, what's one thing that, um, I guess maybe one thing that could go wrong and how to mitigate it that, um, that you wish you knew. One very important thing is that when you interview people, it's going to be much more difficult for you than interviewing somebody from your own country that you're, I mean, all the cues and invisible intuitive things that you're talking to somebody and you immediately know where they come from, what kind of person they are, you know, you know, all those things. You're going to think maybe that you know them when you're talking to this other person from another country, but it's going to be wrong probably. And so it's very easy to make a mistake and think, wow, this person's fantastic. And maybe it's a disaster or vice versa. So Right. Uh, I would say you'd probably be wise to spend more time and focus and energy in the interview process to really make sure you've got the right candidate for the for the role. So that, that yeah, would be an excellent. excellent one. That's excellent. Yeah, that's excellent advice. And that's, you know, that's anyone that's a little bit different than you in, in general, right? Like it's, you, you got to it's great for you to do it and to, to drive that diversity and better understand that individual, but it's also going to be more complex as you're communicating with them. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's excellent advice. I'm, I am curious, how does the, how does the user testing process differ between English speaking and non English speaking markets? There, there are significant differences. So um, for example, when you invite, a, say, a U.S. or a U.K. participant or Canadian or Australian and you ask them, hey, we want you to speak your thoughts out loud and do this and do that. They're generally not shy and, you know, they'll start uh, talking and, well, you know, I, I really I didn't understand this and I think you should have done this. And, you know, um, yeah. being outspoken in that way is, is not necessarily part of the culture of many other uh, non-English speaking countries. So the difficulty sometimes is getting them to speak because they might just, you know, follow the instructions, but not vocalize their thoughts enough. So, uh, so that's one challenge. Um, and, uh, and then there's another challenge is that, you know, sometimes you get people trying to cheat the system. So, you know, maybe we're looking for people in France and somebody connects from Africa pretending to be uh, French. And so we, we, we have all kinds of techniques and systems to, to avoid that. Uh, but, you know, that, that's when, when working internationally, that, that also is an issue. I mean, it can happen in the U S too, but uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that is, that's really interesting. All right. Uh, so to, to close us off here on our founder five, we've got a few quick hit questions that um, I'm really excited to get your take on. So the first one is the number one metric or KPI that you are relentlessly focused on. Net retention rate. So, Bingo. you know, adding in there, um, upsell, downsell, churn. If, if the sum of those three things is positive, what that means is it's, it, you know, it's, it's above a hundred percent. If that's true, then even if you stop selling to new customers, you didn't invest a dime in new customers, you close the door, you didn't ask for any new customers, you would still grow because it's above a hundred percent. So net retention rate, Hugely important in a re, especially a recurring business model like ours. Yeah, well said. Um, second one, uh, top tip for growth stage founders like yourself. That's a tough one. Um, I would say that um, at the end of the day, if your people are average, 
if they're the similar type of people as, say, a 10,000 person company or a 100,000 person company, you're not going to win. Yeah. It's impossible. The odds are against you. So you have to have above average people. Now, when you hire people, you can never be sure, right? It's, it's a theoretical exercise as you go through the interview process. Then you get the person onboarded and then you find out the rubber beats the road. So if they're really bad, you're going to know that soon and they're going to leave. That's not the problem. If they're rock stars, you're going to know that pretty soon, too. And you're going to promote them and, you know, give them more more uh, compensation, etc. So that's not going to be a problem. The problem is, is when they sit in the middle, because then there's going to be this inertia. You know, nobody likes to replace people who are not terrible. They're not, you know, they're they're OK. They're they're part of the normal distribution curve. They're right in the middle. But if you stick to the normal distribution curve, you're not going to win. You have to move it right. And so you have to slowly weed out the ones that are not that, you know, they're just average. And that that's a hard thing to do. It's easy to get rid of the bad ones. That's yeah. a piece of cake. Getting rid of the ones that are not so great, that that's that's kind of tough. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, well, it's. That's well said. Everyone says, you know, hire, hire slow, fire fast, but the, the details of it such as that are, are, are so critical, um, to, to understand. So that's well said. Uh, third one here. All right. Uh, favorite book or podcast or some other medium of your choosing that's helped you to grow as a founder. I really loved a book. Uh, it's, it's a little bit dated. I think it, I, I read it maybe 14 or 15 years ago. It's called Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error. Hmm. And it's a fascinating book. It talks about how, you know, it goes into biology and, you know, psychology and, and all kinds of realms. To, to, and it's got all these practical examples of how sometimes our, our eyes deceive us. And, and it talks about how the human being is conditioned. Like we go into a cocktail party. We see a familiar face. The familiar face goes up to you and says, hey, Jim, how you doing? You know, you should know that person, but you don't, you know, you don't remember their name. So you say, hey, Mary, it's been a long time. You guess. Because guessing is actually a very efficient way of doing things. The problem with guessing is that sometimes you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And that is not a problem. So it's almost like an MVP uh, you know, lean, uh, you know, fail fast type of philosophy, but but that is actually how the human brain works, as opposed to a computer. A computer analyzes every possible combination, or, or at least it used to before ChatGPT, and then um, you know that's not how the human brain brain works. It just guesses. So basically, the book was saying you're going to be wrong a ton of times every day. Don't worry about that. What you should worry about is just learning from it and, and moving on, et cetera. So really interesting book. Well, it's rare someone t talks about something I haven't read on here. So I, I'm excited to read it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. A, a piece of advice that counters what one would consider traditional wisdom. Okay. I don't know if this quite fits into the question, but it's, it's something that I feel strongly about, which is that most uh, small company founders, startups, et cetera, tend to have a goal of raising money from institutional investors like, you know, venture capital. Um, and I think that is absolutely should be the last place they look for financing. I mean, it may be where they end up and there's nothing wrong with uh, VC money or, or private equity money for that matter. Um, they, they can be you know, a great source of, of wisdom and, and, and of help. But if you think about the implicit interest rate they're charging for their money, you know, they're looking for returns of 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1, so really, they're, they're looking for above 100% a year. Now, if a bank came to you and said, hey, we're going to give you a loan and we're going to charge you 100% per year, 
you wouldn't take that very kindly. You wouldn't, that wouldn't be your first port of call, right? right? And that's the way I think we should think of them. Now, the answer to that might be, well, yeah, that's easy to say, but if you don't go to institutional investors, I mean, banks are not gonna give you loans when you're very small, starting out. So how do you finance your business? And there's one source of finance that I think is underutilized, which is working capital. Because once you have a semi-market product fit and you've got a product that you know that people are willing to spend money on, then, um, you know, what's the gross margin that you have built into that product? Is it 80 percent? Is it 90 percent? Is it 50 percent? Is it 30? Whatever it is. OK. What if you just eliminate that in return for the company paying you up front for the entire year? They've just given you a loan at a lower interest rate. And, you know, it doesn't you don't have to necessarily give up all your gross margin. You could give up some of it. But what I'm saying is you could change your pricing model and say, if you pay me up front, I'm going to give you a huge pricing advantage. Advantage for you, you're getting, you know, you're getting relatively inexpensive finance as compared to VCs or whatever. And anyway, so I think working capital is a, is, is a great source of finance. Um, but, you know. If you have to, then you go to VC, you know. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's, uh, it's, that definitely does counter traditional wisdom. It's, it, that's a good one. All right, what is, uh, last one here, what is going to be the title of your autobiography? Title of my autobiography. So um, I'm, I'm thinking back to a, a leadership course that I went to and uh, – and we did a little exercise, and out of that, uh, the, the the kind of title that was assigned to me was "Dancing on the Edge." So uh, I think that's a good description of uh, of my adventures. That's that's a good one. I, I hear I thought you were going to say "User Experience Eats Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast." <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> that, <laughs> That that would be the autobiography of of Userlytics of, of of my company, but uh, yeah, that, that's a different. No, story. That's, that's a different story. But this was this was a good story, and despite the sweltering heat that both of us have in our respective regions right now, I think we produced a pretty cool episode for everyone. So, um, you know, you've given a ton to our listeners today, Alejandro. I think. Uh, I always like to allow a little bit of time for self-promotion at the end. So how, how can those listening help you out? Well, um, we would like to help them, those listening. You know, if, if you're out there and, uh, and you would like to improve the user experience of your website, of your mobile app, of, uh, your prototypes, uh, you know, please visit uh, userlytics.com. Uh, because I'm sure we could find something that, that fits your budget and, and fits your needs. Um, and, uh, as I, as I mentioned about the toothbrush, you know, it's, you don't, you don't have to spend the money of like going to a dental visit, but you know, you have to spend the money rel in relative terms of, you know, just brushing your teeth, maybe not every day, but you know, once a week or once a month or once every two weeks, but, uh, it is truly well worth the investment of time and, and energy and, and money, of course. Well, as someone who just came from the dentist today, dude, uh, probably not taking as good of his teeth as he should have. I can concur with that. I'll <laughs> tell you that. <laughs> and I brush okay. every day. Um, all right. Well, this was this was so awesome, Alejandro. Um, thank you for for everything. Thanks for joining us on the dirt, and thank you those for listening. Um, reach out to Alejandro and uh, get your user experience on track. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much, Jim.